Welcome to this Jeremy Bamba and White House Farm podcast, Season 3. I'm Emma Morris and I'm PR coordinator for the campaign. This is the latest case update for October 2022. Last month, we featured a series of episodes of the presentations made during our anniversary event in Essex. Almost 60 supporters were able to attend and it was great to meet everyone. We hope to be able to organise another get together where we can share more information about the evidence in the future. On the legal front, we are still waiting for a decision on the submissions made to the Criminal Cases Review Commission in March 2021. We do, however, anticipate that we will have more information regarding the status of the review in the near future. You may be aware that in 2020, a legal complaint was made against two key police officers and their actions in the case, including the destruction of case material. The initial review by Essex Police and the Professional Standards Department, the PSD, was less than acceptable and the police commissioner was approached in December 2021. He agreed that the responses were unsatisfactory and instructed a new review of the complaints to be made. This was under a 28-day time limit. However, we only received a response in September 2022. And again, issues have remained uninvestigated. Therefore, further reactions to the PSD are imminent from the legal team. Moving on to campaign news, we have been busy researching and script writing for the forensic podcast, as well as preparing presentations for the monthly Zoom meetings we hold for supporters. These are very successful and informative evening Zoom meetings and all members of our Facebook justice group are invited to join us. If you have not attended one yet, please try and come along to a future meeting, which is a great way for members of our community, both in the UK and overseas, to learn new evidence, listen to guests and ask any questions they may have. We have now achieved the very impressive figure of over half a million views to our videos on TikTok. If you would like to watch these short videos, which give very specific case facts and are released every weekday, please search for Justice, the number four, Jeremy Bamba, on TikTok. We are delighted to have been invited to represent Jeremy at the United Against Injustice conference in Liverpool on the 29th of October. There will be an abundance of speakers at the event discussing their work on wrongful convictions and there will also be speakers who were wrongly convicted themselves. Philip and Yvonne will be making a presentation about Jeremy's case and the evidence. If you would like to attend this free event, you can obtain tickets from Eventbrite. We will give a summary of our time at this event in the next podcast episode. But now we move on to this month's feature, which discusses the evidence of another key officer in Jeremy's case, D.I. Robert Miller, who was responsible for acts of manipulation of evidence in the case. In this episode, we focus on one of the police officers central to the case, Detective Inspector Robert Edward Miller. The significant role played by D.I. Robert Miller in Jeremy's flawed conviction is often overlooked, as the role of DSI Michael Ainsley and DS Stan Jones has attracted more attention. However, the case documents demonstrate Miller's role in the development and manufacturing of evidence against Jeremy. In this episode, we will set out how Miller was aware of the number, and source of gunshot injuries sustained by Sheila, and how he tailored the information he provided to the coroner to cover the cause of her second shot. We also reveal his involvement in the manufacturing of evidence then used to implicate Jeremy. Miller's malevolent part in the framing of Jeremy has been encapsulated in several television documentaries over the years. This includes his appearance in The Crimes That Shook Britain programme on Jeremy's case when he said that I believe 100% that the right person is in prison followed by an evil smirk and oddly a shake rather than a nod of his head as he spoke these words. Thus, Miller seemed to inadvertently reveal his knowledge and complicity in the corruption 
that resulted in the jailing of an innocent man and the pleasure that he seemed to take in it. Robert Miller worked for the Criminal Investigation Department, CID, of Essex Police and was based at Witham Police Station. In 1985, he held the rank of Detective Inspector. On the morning of 7th of August 1985, he arrived at White House Farm with DS Stanley Brian Jones at approximately 9.15am. Parking their car on Pages Lane, Jones and Miller made their way to the house in the company of Inspector Montgomery, D.I. Cook and P.S. Woodcock, and eventually entered the house via the back door before making a right turn in order to enter the kitchen. Miller stated in evidence that during his time in the house, he entered the ground floor office, the kitchen, main hallway, lounge, dining room, main stairway, Sheila's bedroom, the main bedroom and the children's bedroom. He also stated that he did not move or touch anything in that time. In documents compiled by the City of London Police during their investigations in 1991, They raised the point that Miller had recorded in his pocket notebook that when he saw the body of Sheila in the main bedroom, the point twenty-two rifle by her side, Bible lay alongside. This key evidence of the rifle being by her side when Miller saw Sheila cannot be a mistake. If it was lying across Sheila's chest, as shown in the crime scene photographs, he surely would have stated this was the position and not that it lay alongside her body. Unfortunately, the City of London Police failed to see the significance of this evidence, and did not investigate the issue any further. It is now known that the scene was restaged, and that the rifle on Sheila's body can be shown to be in differing positions during the crime scene photographs taken later on in the morning. Therefore, the rifle was moved before and during the photographing process. Undisclosed statements from officers who entered the house prior to Miller may also confirm that when they saw Sheila, the rifle was at her side. But, to date, Essex Police and the CPS still refuse to disclose these important statements. In his October 1985 statement, Miller stated that he looked at the deceased before leaving the house and striking up a conversation with DCI Jones and the divisional commander for the Chelmsford Police Division. CSI Harris. As a result of this conversation, he entered the house a second time with the coroner's officer, PC Wright. Oddly, Wright had arrived at the scene between 8am and 8.30am and yet had to wait between one and a half and two hours before being accompanied around the house. However, from statements made by Wright, it is clear that Sheila still only had a single gunshot injury when he saw her. It is unknown how long Wright and Miller were in the house on this occasion, but it is recorded that Miller left the scene at 10.59am. By 3.30pm, Miller had joined multiple police officers at the mortuary to attend the post-mortem examinations, first of Neville and then of Sheila. It is astounding that so many officers were permitted to attend the three hours of post-mortem examinations with at least seven police officers present, as well as the pathologist, Dr. Venezis, and his assistants. These officers were named in the autopsy notes as Miller, Cook, Davidson, Hammersley, Bird, Wright and Wynne. We know that Davidson and Hammersley were there to seize exhibits, with Bird as the photographer and Wright in his capacity of coroner's officer for the purpose of identification. It has never been explained why Cook, Wynne, and Miller felt the need to attend. We know that police told Dr. Venasis this was a case of murder-suicide, and perhaps this and the sheer number of observers watching his examination made him rush, because he missed injuries that we now know to have been present on both Sheila and Neville, all of which Dr. Venasis can be shown to have failed to record on official documentation. The following day, 8th of August, Miller returned to the mortuary to observe the post-mortem examinations of June, Nicholas and Daniel, which continued until mid-afternoon. The 1986 Dickinson inquiry and the later Byford report state that Venasis, in his capacity as the pathologist, should have been called to the scene on the day itself, with the bodies in situ. However, D.I. Ron Cook of Essex Police, the senior forensic officer, 
stated that he thought this had been unnecessary at the time, probably because there were no suspicious circumstances and the police knew that this was a case of murder-suicide. The next entry in his notebook, dated 8th of August, sets out that at 11.30pm he arrived at Braintree and therefore what he did and what he observed between half past four in the afternoon and 11.30 in the evening is not recorded. Could he have been in conversation with Venasis, explaining that when he saw Sheila, she only had a single gunshot injury? Could he have been demonstrating that the rifle was not on Sheila's body when he saw it, but was by her side? Miller is then documented as being on three days leave before resuming his duties on the 12th of August. According to his notebook, he was at Witham on inquiries related to the Bamba murders, although there are no details of what these involved. The next recorded involvement of Miller was on the 13th of August, when he was at Witham Police Station with Cook, where he was apparently shown the sound moderator that Jones had collected from Peter Eaton the previous day. This was the moderator that had been discovered inside a dusty cardboard box in the gun cupboard at White House Farm by David Bowflower on the 10th of August. This moderator was collected from the home of Anne Eaton on the 12th of August and remained in the boot of Jones's car overnight. Miller later gave evidence in a statement that he saw a scratch mark and a burr on this moderator. He also saw a grey hair, which he described as being approximately three quarters of an inch long, attached to the burr. During multiple appearances on TV programmes, Miller has relied heavily on presenting the argument of a grey hair being present on a silencer which he describes in great detail with a smile ever present on his face while doing so. According to the police and the prosecution, this grey hair proved that Neville Bamber was hit over the head by Jeremy, using the rifle with a sound moderator attached to it. This supported two prosecution contentions. Firstly, that along with the scratch damage to the Arga, the paint within the knurl pattern on the moderator and the blood discovered inside the moderator which matched the group of Sheila, the grey hair proved that the sound moderator was attached to the rifle during the incident. Secondly, the Crown argued it showed that Jeremy must have been the perpetrator, as Sheila would not have been strong enough to prevail in a struggle with her father. We can now undermine all of those arguments presented by the Crown, but as we are focused on Miller today, we will concentrate on the grey hair and the fact that by the time exhibits were taken to the lab on the 13th of August, this grey hair had vanished. However, an analysis of the Essex Police actions from 1985 revealed action number 1616, dated May 1986, questioned what had happened to that hair. Cook responded that it had been lost and that should have been an end to it. But in 2002, the Metropolitan Police discovered the whereabouts of the hair. Written details of a telephone conversation which took place at the time have been uncovered, which state, I received a call from Detective Superintendent Bernard. D.I. Brown had just left him after a meeting to discuss action 1616 relating to the hair stuck to this action. Mr. Bernard has re-examined this action and recognises the writing in pencil as that of Stan Jones. He asked how I would like him to proceed with this information. I advised Mr. Bernard that I would prefer him not to contact Stan and that officers from this investigation would contact him to pursue the hair. DCI McDermott of West Hendon Police stated, I advised Mr. Bernard that D.I. Brown would meet up with him in order that he could view the action, in order to establish how the hair had become attached to the action. Therefore, Stoke and Church discovered that not only was there a grey hair attached to the original Essex Police action with sellotape, presumably attached to it by Stan Jones, but they also revealed further information as Met Police Action 319 states, Action 1616 relates to establishing what happened to the hair found on the moderator was found to have strands of hair sellotaped to it. So not only had Stoke and Church discovered the whereabouts of the missing grey hair, it now appeared to have morphed into multiple hairs. Sellotaped to the original Essex Police Action Report, this hair and or hairs have never been made available to the defence. 
The fact that the Met Police did not request this evidence be DNA tested is inexcusable, particularly as it was a fundamental crown issue at trial and was used to implicate Jeremy. Not only that, but the testing of this hair to determine its source would have prevented Miller from giving wholly misleading information to the public for years. Back to 1985, and at 10.40am on the 14th of August, Miller attended Braintree's coroner's court to provide details of the five deaths to the coroner. He requested that a two-month adjournment be granted. The coroner, convinced that the evidence proved this was a case of murder-suicide, gave permission for the bodies of the deceased to be released to the family for the funerals. The full coroner's report has never been disclosed to the defence, and the many requests made for the report ever since have been met with the denial that the court has retained the documentation. The campaign strongly believed that the full coroner's report contained the explanation that Sheila's second wound was caused during the police firearms training exercises on the morning of August 7th at White House Farm. So what evidence did Miller provide to the coroner about the injuries to Sheila? In his statement dated October 85, and in his report for the coroner, he said that when he saw Sheila in the main bedroom of the farmhouse, the wound appeared to have been made by her own hand. So on two separate occasions, Miller stated under oath that Sheila had only one wound, singular, when he first saw her. During his evidence to the City of London Police in 1991, Miller informed the investigating officers that it appears the gunshot was to her neck. This is consistent with the evidence he provided in 1985 that when he saw Sheila, she had a single gunshot injury. This also confirms the evidence of five other senior officers who entered the house prior to any photographs being taken, who each stated that they saw Sheila with only one gunshot wound. Later in the afternoon on 14th of August, Miller was back at Witham and involved in a discussion with Cook and Jones and he also met Jeremy there to discuss the funeral arrangements. Miller gave evidence that officers asked Jeremy if they could attend the farm later that day with Anne Eaton in order to take measurements of the rooms. According to his notebook, Miller stated that the visit and meeting with Anne Eaton was to discuss security. Miller also recorded the apparent reaction of Jeremy and noted he said it would be all right and added words to the effect, I don't want anything stolen though. Sergeant Jones said words to the effect, Don't start saying these sort of things to me, I don't like it. Bamba smiled and said words to the effect, I was only joking. Is it any wonder Jeremy said those words though, knowing what we know now about Anne Eaton, her father Robert and her brother David taking valuable items and cash from the farmhouse against Jeremy's and the accountant's express instructions. Two hours later, these three officers met Anne Eaton at White House Farm. However, they were not really there to take measurements. The evidence now shows a number of questionable things happened in the farmhouse on this occasion. Firstly, photographs were taken of a footprint which Anne Eaton supposedly pointed out which was on a pile of magazines inside the lounge below the window. The photographs of the footprint and exhibit label for those images are set out and fully referenced in police documents. However, in his report to the Director of Public Prosecutions, written in November 1985, DSI Ainsley denied that such a footprint, or any photographs of it, existed. The DPP simply accepted the word of Ainsley without checking the facts. Had the DPP done so, it would have been established that lies were being told, and that photographs did exist. These photographs still remain undisclosed to this day, even though we have provided clear references to the source material and references to the hidden images and exhibit labels. The police also seized additional exhibits that day, including two pairs of shoes belonging to Sheila and, most importantly, took paint samples from under the mantel shelf of the kitchen arga. This is a very odd thing for Jones, Cook and Miller to do because at that stage there were no paint flakes impacted into the muzzle end of either the silencers the police had submitted to the laboratory and no one had seen any scratch marks on the mantel shelf at this time. In fact, 
It was over five weeks later before paint flakes, which were apparently consistent with the paint layers of the Aga, were discovered. These paint flakes were fanged on silencer SBJ-1, the one found on the day of the tragedies by DS Jones. The only paint seen on sound moderator DB-1 found by David Bowflower was a single tiny smear on the muzzle end of it. The evidence now shows that Miller, Cook and Jones lied regarding the apparent single paint sample taken from the underside of the Arga mantel shelf at the farm. In his statement of October 1985, Miller said, I was present when Detective Inspector Cook took paint samples from the area near to the gouge marks. And though he was present at the farm, it was Miller and not Cook who took a paint sample that day. It can now also be shown that it was the actions of the three police officers present, Miller, Cook and Jones, that caused all the damage to the underside of the mantel shelf. This was ultimately used to link silencer SBJ-1, seized by Jones from the scene on the 7th of August, to the incident. An entry in Miller's pocketbook which read, Plus, take red paint sample from mantel was examined by forensic scientist Dr. Baxendale in 1991. Baxendale used a process known as electrostatic detection apparatus testing, more commonly referred to as ESDA testing. This involves examining a questionable document using a specialised piece of equipment which reveals indentations and impressions on paper which may not be visible to the naked eye. Following the testing of Miller's pocket notebook, Baxendale concluded that the ink was more heavily deposited than the ink of the preceding and following entries, and that the entry was made out of sequence. It had therefore been added at a different time. So how can we prove that Miller took a paint sample? That evidence comes from the Holmesbock index schedules released to the defence in 2011. The study of these documents revealed that a document in Holmesbox 12-34 was a general examination record of a paint sample with the reference RM-1. Thankfully, we found this entry on the index as Essex Police have never disclosed this general examination record or the fact that Miller took this sample. In addition, the case material proves that no matter what the police would have you believe, the first date anyone in the family saw any scratches was, according to Anthony Pargeter, when he saw some after the funerals. However, not a single witness, including the housekeeper, reported that there were any scratches on the underside of the Arga mantelpiece in any statements prior to Jeremy's first arrest and release without charge. And then, when they did eventually make statements, they each referred to a yellow sticker on the underside of the mantelpiece. We now know that this yellow sticker was stuck to the underside of the shelf, supposedly by Cook, who said he placed it there to indicate the area where his paint sample had been taken from. Initially, we assumed that this was on the 14th of August. However, in recent months, we have discovered photographic evidence that proves the yellow sticker was not in place until after fingerprints had been taken on the 8th and 9th of September 1985. What also seems very peculiar is that Miller did not provide his fingerprints for elimination purposes. The instruction was that elimination prints should be taken from anyone who had been in the house between the 7th of August and the 8th of September 1985, and yet Miller did not provide his. We strongly suspect that the reason for this is because Miller's prints would have been all over the Argus around providing evidence that he interfered with the paintwork. However, although no evidence has been disclosed regarding whose fingerprints were discovered on the Argus around, Essex police are not as smart as they think they are, as they accidentally have disclosed evidence that Miller, Cook and Jones took a paint sample from the Argus on at least two occasions. We now have the evidence that Miller's sample was compared to the tiny smear of red paint on the sound moderator DB1 by a scientist at Huntingdon Laboratory on the 12th of September 1985. This fact was a closely guarded secret until 2020, 
when the CPS inadvertently revealed this previously unknown examination during the judicial review. Owing to the fact that the sample did not match that of the tiny spot of paint on the sound moderator DB1, the police at that point had nothing at all to link either of the two silencers in their possession to the scene. It is provable by looking at these photographs that further scratch damage happened to the Arga on the 14th of September, and it was at this time that we can now show that Cook took his sample and that paint became impacted into the previously uncontaminated silencer SBJ1. In fact, we can now show that all of the damage to the underside of the mantelpiece was caused as a result of samples being taken and had nothing to do with the tragedy and it was not present on August 7th. But you don't need to simply accept our word for that as this was confirmed by forensic scientist Brian Elliott, who gave evidence in his witness statement, dated 3rd of October 1991, at page 8, that I understood that there were marks on the underside of the mantelpiece in the kitchen from where the paint scrapings were taken. Elliott's evidence, in addition to the lack of paint on the kitchen floor on the crime scene images taken on the 7th of August, reinforces the fact that the damage to the underside of the mantel shelf and the fascia of the Arga were not as a result of the incident, but was solely from the taking of the paint samples by three Essex police officers long after the shootings. The complete picture of all the evidence about the paint and the scratch marks to the Arga mantel shelf and surround will be discussed in detail in a forensic podcast in the very near future. However, we can now say with certainty that all of the paint evidence used against Jeremy at trial was false and had been fabricated by Essex police officers. On the 16th of August, Miller, along with D.S. Barlow, attended the funerals of June, Neville and Sheila. In a witness statement, Miller made the following comment. At about half past four the same day, I was present at Nine Head Street Goldhanger with mourners and relatives when Jeremy Bamber, on ascending the stairs, revealed to the inside of his black suit the name Boss and said words to the effect that It's me now and I'll have to make sure I don't crease it. I've got to give it back in the morning. I asked Jeremy about this comment and he strongly denies making it. But we don't have to just take Jeremy's word for it because neither Barlow, who was with Miller at the time, or any other witnesses said that this happened. The following day, Miller was on leave until his return to duties on the 1st of September. On the 7th of September, the event sequence document states that Miller attended WHF. With four uniform FSU plus two vehicles, scenes of crime officer plus vehicle, two CID officers plus transit. It is not known what the purpose of this visit was, although it appears that it followed the telephone call from Malcolm Waters, who informed the police of what Julie Mugford had told him about her claims of Jeremy's involvement in the tragedies. It is known that when Julie Mugford arrived at the police station, after the police collected her from Malcolm's home with her friend Elizabeth Rimmington, Miller and Jones interviewed her. The transcript from this interview with Mugford has never been disclosed, nor were any notes made of the detail of the interview. On the 9th of September, Miller was also involved in arresting Matthew MacDonald, the man Mugford named as the supposed hitman who had carried out the shooting at Jeremy's behest. During the 10th and 11th of September, Miller and his colleague DCW Clark interviewed MacDonald. But who is DCW Clark? No statements or documentation has been disclosed in relation to DCW Clark and therefore we have been unable to establish his involvement in the case and what further actions he was responsible for. Although it appears Miller was not involved in the interviews with Jeremy on his first arrest and release without charge, he was present at Dover Docks on the 29th of September with DS Jones and DC Clark when Jeremy was arrested on his return from France. Home Office Box 7-37 contains a document which refers to inquiry notes provided by DS162 Bernard on the 25th of November 1986 for the Dickinson Inquiry. These notes were held by Miller 
although were allegedly written by DS Stan Jones. They set out what appears to be Jones's scenario of events on and after the 7th of August. Although it is unknown when these notes were written, the content clearly sets out how Jones and others tried to implicate Jeremy. These notes, listed as Holmes Box 7 40, state Jeremy left house on night in question, stayed at home to later return to WHF on foot or bike, pushed key from back door, took key from coal shed and let himself in, slash returned key locked door inside, got gun, shot children, then June and Neville, then shot Sheila, arranged gun on Sheila to look like suicide, got home by bike through fields, checked fields for tracks, none, wore wetsuit during murders, so no forensics left went to Eastbourne to get salt water on suit. The assertions regarding the use of a key were impossible as the back door was locked and bolted from the inside with the key in the lock. Oddly, Bernard's document regarding these notes states that it was not known where the original notes were and that those provided were photocopies. Why were the originals hidden? What else did they say that reveals how key officers tried to implicate Jeremy. Although Miller did not give evidence at trial, it is documented that he was interviewed by DCI Dickinson for the post-trial internal Essex Police investigation. Although it is known that this interview took place, no notes of the interview of Miller have ever been disclosed. Considering he was heavily involved from the outset, the non-disclosure of his evidence is very suspicious. On the 27th of March, 1991, Miller was issued a Regulation 7 disciplinary order regarding evidence that he had provided to the coroner. The charge against him was, on the 14th of August, 1995, attended Braintree Magistrates Court and withheld evidence from the coroner, opening an inquest into the deaths of Ralph Bamber, June Bamber, Sheila Caffell, Daniel Caffell and Nicholas Caffell in that you stated that police were satisfied no other person was involved in the murders when in fact police had evidence on that date that this was not the case. The interview and statements Miller provided to the City of London Police regarding this matter have never been disclosed by either Essex Police or the CPS. This clearly begs the question of why not? Did Miller go into detail regarding the position of the rifle when he first saw Sheila? As we set out earlier, he saw it at the side of her body prior to photographs being taken. Did Miller also set out to COLP officers more detail about the single gunshot injury he witnessed to Sheila? It is also possible that Miller revealed both of these facts to the coroner at the time of the inquest on the 15th of August 1985. However, the coroner's court state they do not have the coroner's report and Essex police refused to disclose the copy that they must surely have within the case material. Ultimately, the City of London Police and the CPS never charged Miller, and the Regulation 7 notice was removed. DSI Ainsley's event sequence document, in which he began to record his instructions regarding daily activity, and his instructions after the 7th of September 1985, has proven to be a very helpful tool for us in establishing the involvement of Miller, which is not set out in any other documentation. In addition, internal police messages from the same period have also borne fruit for us in establishing previously unknown facts. For instance, Essex Police Message Number 103 details a message from DS219 Davidson to remind Miller to take a Scenes of Crime video to Huntingdon Forensic Science Laboratory. The event sequence document reveals that on 18th of September, Miller was instructed to attend the Forensic Science Laboratory along with Ainsley, DCI Jones, DS Jones, Wright, Cook and Wilkinson for a round-the-table conference with scientific staff. Also present at the meeting were Mr Adams from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and the pathologist, Dr. Venasis. It is unknown what exactly was discussed at this meeting, as only a very few and extremely brief notes have ever been disclosed. Did they watch the scenes of crime video Miller had been instructed to take? 
did this video contain evidence that the scene had been altered and manipulated by Essex police officers? We simply have no way of establishing this, as this video has never been disclosed. Likewise, Miller failed to make a statement setting out the reason why he was requested to attend that lab on that day or what occurred at this meeting. Within days of this meeting, Ainsley requested that Miller should visit the headquarters of the firearms team to debrief the officers who attended White House Farm on the 7th of August 1985. Again, it is unknown what was discussed at the debrief, and oddly, not a single firearms officer referred to this in any witness statement. We now know that at least 29 FSU officers attended the scene on the 7th of August. But as with the majority of areas in this case, we have not had full disclosure and the statements of at least 11 FSU officers have never been disclosed. Miller is known to have been instructed to attend the Forensic Science Laboratory for a second case conference on the 21st of November 1985, which he attended with Ainsley Wilkinson Cook, Mr. Burf CPS, Mr. Adams DPP and forensic scientists. But the purpose of his presence and what was discussed remains unknown. The events sequence document compiled by Ainsley has been invaluable in being able to show that statements from key witnesses were not only edited, but that from the 10th of October 1985, Miller and his colleague Stan Jones were central to this process. In the first instance, on this date, they were instructed by Ainsley to sort the statements in their possession into material and non-material evidence. In short, they selected which statements would be used in evidence against Jeremy and which would never be used. This process continued for a number of weeks and it appears that these statements were finally sorted and the decisions made as to which should be used by the 26th of November 1985. It is interesting to note that it appears great care was taken in making the decision as to which of the testimonies made up to that date should and should not be presented to the DPP during a meeting that would be held at the DPP's office on the 9th of December. The record of the DPP's notebook from that meeting and an earlier meeting with Ainsley, Jones and Miller on the 25th of September 1985 reveals that, for the most part, the statements discussed with the DPP have still never been disclosed to the defence. As such, their content and the evidence they provided which was used in order to, firstly, have Jeremy charged with murder and then to have him committed for trial, remains unknown. We now have substantial evidence regarding this issue and we can demonstrate how statements referred to had not even been written by the dates of the meetings, and we will discuss this issue more fully in the future. Following the meeting with the DPP on 9th of December, the event sequence log sets out how Miller was instructed, with Ainsley and P.C. Widden, to edit the statements that had been shown to the DPP. This editing was supervised by Miller, as set out in the document which states that on the 12th of December, Miller was, with SIO, DSI Ainsley, preparing edited statements for typing. This continued for a number of days as follows. 16th of December 1985, typist from headquarters continues to type edited statements supervised by D.I. Miller. 18th of December 1985, D.I. Miller and team continue to prepare edited file for DPP. 20th of December 1985, D.I. Miller, D.S. Bernard and P.C. Widden to DPP officer with edited file. Just what was edited from these statements? We simply have no way of knowing. As we have already set out, the vast majority of the discussed statements have never been disclosed and of those that have, we only have the edited typed versions and not the original unedited handwritten versions. And so there we will conclude this episode about the actions of D.I. Robert Miller and his involvement in the case. We have set out how, from the outset, he was one of the key officers involved in a number of important areas, from the single gunshot he observed to Sheila and the position of the rifle, to the evidence he gave the coroner's court 
He was central to the police narrative. We have explained how he was involved in key interviews and in the editing of witness statements, as well as his involvement at meetings at the laboratory, and particularly the secret taking of a paint sample we were never supposed to know about. Robert Miller died, aged 66, on the 16th of August 2015. And thankfully, we won't therefore be subjected to watching any new footage of him pushing forward discredited evidence. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to do something to help Jeremy Bamber, then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents that are still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamba. Don't forget to share the link with your friends and family.